Good evening, everyone, and welcome once again uh, for our FOF. And thanks for being in person. Uh, today there is nobody on Zoom, so I hope somebody joins a little later. So I think everybody is here today. Uh, so we have Abhishek Goenka from our research team who tracks chemicals, healthcare, and uh, agri inputs. So we thought since the Kharif sowing season has just begun, it will be interesting to look at this topic. Uh, over to you, Abhishek. Thanks, Arunat. Uh, good evening, everyone. So. I hope uh, everyone has taken a note of these upcoming FOF dates. So today we are going to look at uh, not so very fancy agriculture sector. And the topic for today is uh, agri inputs industry. We'll divide this uh, topic into three sub-segments, uh, fertilizers, agrochemicals and seeds. We'll look at each of them one by one. So it is said that if agriculture goes wrong, nothing else will go right. These are the words of M.S. Swaminathan, who is the father of Green Revolution in India and probably very apt for an agrarian economy like India. The reason is uh, almost 58% of the population even today depends their livelihood on various forms of agricultural activities. And that is very crucial uh, not only for the country's uh, food security but also for the growth of rural sector. If we see the market size of uh, uh, global market size of fertilizers and agrochemicals, it is close to $215 billion, where India's share is uh, inching up. It today stands at 12%, whereas China is leading at 30%. Rising population, uh, recently we have heard that India has become the most populous nation, and hence that is also driving the demand of food grains overall. So we'll uh, look at uh, the two major agricultural seasons in India. The first one is Kharif season which is also known as a rainy season, uh, where the crops are sown from April to September month. Uh, so these are basically the crops which require high requirement of water. So mainly we see paddy and cotton are the crops which are grown during the Kharif season. The second season is the Rabi season, also known as a winter crop season, where the sowing is done from October to April. Wheat and pulses are the main crops here. So this is a chart on uh, total arable land, basically where agricultural activity is being conducted today. So if we see this chart, uh, somewhere in 1990, uh, the figures have come down from 163 million hectares of land. It has now come down to 156 hectares of land somewhere in 2015. And probably this is a cause of worry as the overall food requirement, which is increasing as the population increases, now it needs to be met from the less remaining available land. So this chart depicts uh, the area which is under irrigation. Uh, if you see uh, over the last 15 years, uh, the total irrigated land, uh, which was around 60 million hectares in 2006, it has now grown to 68 million hectares in 2017, which is a promising trend. So government is taking a lot of initiatives uh, to increase the area under irrigation and which has shown uh, positive results. Apart from this, government plans to undertake over 250 new irrigation projects which has got the potential to irrigate roughly around 20 million of additional land, 20 million hectares of additional land. So, uh, so basically, the agricultural produce is the farmer's revenue and which is uncertain given the monsoon erratic season. So, what is uh, in control of the farmers is the overall cost of farming which can decide its true earnings for a season. So overall uh, agricultural cost can be divided into two parts. One is agri input cost, which is nothing but the raw materials part. Uh, second is the operating cost. Uh, within agri inputs, fertilizer uh, forms the largest cost component, roughly around 50% of the overall agri input cost. Uh, agrochemicals accounts for 20% of total agri input cost for farmers, and seeds is close to 30%. Uh, within the operating cost, uh, it includes the human labor, machinery and irrigation charges. Human labor costs are the largest component for Indian farmers who still depend a lot on the human labor as against the agrochemicals. So we'll look at uh, fertilizer, fertilizer segment first. So the total consumption requirement of India annually is close to 64 million tons. And the types of fertilizers are basically urea and non-urea. Uh, roughly 20% of both the categories are being imported by India. Uh, within non-urea, we can classify the fertilizer into three segments. One is DAP, which is nothing but the diammonium phosphate. Second is uh, complex 
non urea fertilizer third is sulfuric based fertilizer we'll see the classification in detail so a particular type of fertilizer can be identified by its ingredient uh, fertilizer contains mainly three uh, nutrients in the order of n p k n stands for nitrogen p stands for phosphorus and k stands for potassium so each bag of fertilizer will contain this numbers and these nutrients are nothing but the percentage of weight of that particular bag so if you look at this picture on the left hand side is the urea bag which contains 46% nitrogen and 0% uh, component of p and 0% com component of k whereas on the right hand side the numbers are 10 26 26 so 10% is nitrogen 26% is phosphorus and another 26% is potassium so basically the properties of each of these ingredients are uh, so nitrogen provides a rich green in color which provides a leafy growth to the crop phosphorus focuses uh, the energy on the strong root development of the crop and potassium enhances the overall growth of the plant so we we'll look at uh, characteristics of uh, fertilizer so as we said uh, urea only contains nitrogen so among the NPK, 46% uh, is generally nitrogen in a urea bed, whereas potassium and uh, phosphorate is 0-0% each. Within non-urea, DAP contains 18% uh, nitrogen, 46% phosphate, and 0% potassium. Uh, in case of complex, it com contains all the three elements, N, P, and K. Uh, in case of sulfuric acid, there is a fourth element, which is nothing but the sulfuric acid. If you see the cost difference today, so urea bag is coming close to uh, 250 rupees per 50 kg bag and the subsidy amount is uh, almost 10x which is 2500 uh, so definitely the selling price is far far lower than the cost and hence the subsidy element in case of DAP uh, the cost of bag is close to 1200 rupees per 50 kg bag and the subsidy amount is almost similar to urea which is 2500 per 50 kg bag as far as the manufacturing process is concerned so urea is far simpler uh, basically, you need uh, nitrogen, which is uh, mixed with hydrogen from natural gas, and uh, it is uh, created uh, ammonia to come at the final product of urea. Whereas in non urea, you need two more chemical element, which is the phosphoric acid and the sulfuric acid. So, this is the global fertilizer industry. Uh, if we see the left hand side chart, so close to 60% of the nutrient uh, contained by the fertilizers are nitrogen based fertilizers uh, phosphorus and potassium are close to 20% each as far as the last last 10 years growth is concerned uh, nitrogen phosphorus and potash they have grown at very dismal amount of 2 1 and 2% each uh, in terms of country uh, so china leads the consumption of uh, fertilizers uh, followed by india and us so industry is very uh, concentrated among the few countries, China, India and US, which forms the major uh, composition of uh, fertilizer consumption. These are the uh, growth figures, 3 year, 5 year and 10 year uh, of urea and non-urea. So urea, if you see, uh, 10 year growth is close to 1.4%, uh, whereas 3 year and 5 year is slightly negative. Uh, as compared to that, the DAP has grown uh, much better than urea. 6.8% for 3 years and 2.2% for the last 10 years. Similarly, uh, SSP, which is sulfuric based acid, uh, sulfuric based fertilizers, it has grown at 4.2% for 10 years and negative growth for 3 and 5 years period. MOP based uh, fertilizer, which is nothing but the potassium, uh, it has grown 3.4% uh, for 3 years and 7.4% for 5 years. So this is a uh, raw material requirement for each category of fertilizers. So as we have seen, uh, natural gas is a major component for both urea and non-urea. So roughly 70% of the fertilizer cost is natural gas, which is uh, imported by India. Apart from this, if we see the uh, uh, non-urea based fertilizers, so phosphoric acid, uh, we are uh, importing around 50%, 55% of the demand. Uh, ammonia again is uh, imported and phosphate rock is 80 to 90% of the demand is met by import. 
so most of the raw material parts are concerned uh, is being imported from various geographies so these are some of the reforms which has helped the sector in the recent years the the recent one is neem coating of urea so what used to happen is lot of this urea was being uh, illegally transferred to the chemical industries for usage because lot of the subsidies are available so what government has done is it is made compulsory that you need to neem coat the urea so that it can't be used for other chemical industries so that has helped been uh, utilizing the urea only for the agriculture purpose second is they have reduced the uh, size bag from 50 kg to 45 kg so a lot of time these farmers are unaware and they used to uh, sprinkle the fertilizers in a haphazard manner so be it a 45 kg bag or a 50 kg they used to waste a lot of time these extra 5 kg bags so the same output is now being uh, uh, the, uh, the results are achieved with a 45 kg bag so that has helped in some sort of savings uh pre export so so far india doesn't export uh, although we are importing uh, both category of urea but it has allowed uh, this category uh, non urea specifically ke you can uh, start exporting going forward so we might see some kind of traction especially in the non urea which is a non regulated sector to start showing some uh, export numbers uh urea prices are largely uh, uniform across the country but government has uh, made uniform all the tax receipt rates across the country so that uh, people can't buy from particular state and misuse in other other states and last is the new uh, uh, urea investment policy where they will be uh, coming up with the new plants uh, so the chambal uh, matrix fertilizer and few more are in uh, stage to uh, get these plants so we we'll look at some of these uh, non government factors so coming on to climate india is likely to witness rising temperatures with the global warming such climate changes are will gradually increase pest population and hurting the global uh, crop yields agri inputs companies need to address this with better solution and quality products which should create huge opportunities in coming years rising food demand so as we have seen recently india's population has become the largest populated country in the world which will lead to a 70% increase in food demand also rising incomes in low and middle class segment is changing the india's food consumption pattern with more demand for fruits and vegetables third is uh, labor shortage so globally we see india is having this uh, labor cost advantage which is a significant part of cost of cultivation so that has helped in overall lowering the cost of uh, uh, agriculture reduction in prices rising export markets uh india's advantage of low cost production and skill manpower should support the uh, growth of indian agrochemical exports last is uh, political parties so in india we have seen uh, during the election years uh, most of the times uh, loan waivers or extra subsidies are allowed so these things again work in the favor of the uh, segment budgetary allocations so if we see uh, the last five years uh, tra trajectory uh, crop insurance uh, budget allocation has increased from 109 billion 119 billion to 155 uh, billion uh, interest subsidy has increased from 115 billion to 181 billion and pm kisan uh, uh, yojana uh, the overall budget allocation has increased from 12 billion to 680 billion so if we just total up it was close to 300 billion somewhere in 2019 which has now come close to 1000 billion so this figure has uh, dramatically increased and overall the budget is increasing which augurs well for the sector nitrogen so we'll look at all three uh, ingredients uh so asia is the largest uh, contributor when it comes to nitrogen and within asia china and india are the major countries which produces nitrogen any change in action plans of uh, so few of the uh, companies are concentrated in both china and india and any uh, actions in demand and supply it can create problem in the uh, global uh, fertilizer prices phosphatic fertilizers uh, asia contributes close to 43% of the production 53% of the production and again uh, china us and india are the leading producers in terms of uh, export market so china influences the trade with almost 40% of the global trade coming out of china 
whereas Brazil and India being the major importers. Potash fertilizers. So here Europe is uh, leading in terms of overall production, followed by US and Asian region. Individual country wise, if we see, Canada and Russia are the major producers of potash. India, Brazil, and China are the major importers. So we look at a uh, few of the uh, analysis of peer companies in this sector. Historically, uh, urea companies, uh, urea specific companies have struggled to grow their revenue. However, revenue growth has been excellent over the past three years with increasing realizations and recovery in the global demand. So if you see, uh, Coromandel uh, is having 80% of its revenue coming from fertilizer, uh, whereas 20% is coming from the crop protection uh, chemicals. Uh, players with uh, P and K focused ingredients uh, have seen better growth as they have a more diversified business. Uh, Karumandal and GSFC have seen double digit revenue growth over the past decade due to a non urea product portfolio. So, non urea is a segment where the prices are not controlled, so they are able to get the maximum benefit in a rising market. Margin trend uh, so, this is a bit the margin. Uh, Non-urea producers uh, generally enjoy uh, better uh, margins. Diversified companies such as Coromandel uh, and Deepak Fertilizer have better margins because their portfolio covers different segments apart from the fertilizers like agrochemicals, industrial chemicals and others. Chambal has gradually improved its margins over the past five years by discontinuing the non-core businesses and better non-urea trading exposures. Among the PSU companies like uh, National Fertilizers, uh, GSFC and RCF, they still struggle to improve their margins mainly due to operational inefficiency and competition from private companies. So if you see globally, uh, fertilizer companies have better margins than their Indian counterparts because these global companies are uh, completely backward integrated and they have a global presence. So this is the ROE trend for last five years. Again, uh, if you see uh, Coromandel having a diversified business have better ROE and rather more consistent ROE whereas in case of Chambal, the ROE has improved over the last 5 years. In case of others, National Fertilizer, GSFC and Deepak, the numbers are very volatile. Data days. So, core concern uh, for this uh, fertilizer segment is the delay in receiving the subsidies from the government. So, urea companies such as uh, RCF, NFL, uh, which is National Fertilizers, and GSFC, which are uh, PSA companies, they have received days piled as high as six months because subsidy contribution is a large share of their overall realization. Uh, in case of Coromandel EPC, the days uh, have reduced from 50 to almost 10 days now. So we look at the uh, agrochemicals segment. So basically, uh, these are the chemical which are used in the process of agriculture. Basically, these are chemical products and not naturally derived, but man-made. So, this chemical act as a protector, uh, protecting the crops from pests. Uh, it could be weeds, insects, etc. And they try to enhance the overall crop yield. So, the types of agrochemicals, uh, first is insecticides. So, these are the chemicals used to protect crops from insects by either killing them or preventing the attack on the crop. Second is fungicides. Uh, these are the chemicals which prevent or destroy the growth of fungus. Uh, India being a tropical country, uh, so there is a UV climate, there are always chances that fungus material gets developed around the plant. So fungicides helps to tackle those fungus. Herbicides. So these are also known as weed killer. So these are the weeds are the substances that unwantedly grow around the plants. Uh, so chemicals are used to control the unwanted stuffs which specifically grows during the rainy season. The weeds when grown in length and occupy space, they don't allow the sunlight to reach to the main plant and they act as an obstacle for the uh, crop growth. We look at the value chain of agrochemicals. So this value chain is very similar to a pharma industry where uh, uh, there is a KSM which is a key starting material uh, which starts from the value chain and the next process is uh, API and from API we move to the final formulation. So similarly here, uh, the RM supplier will supply the intermediates uh, 
टू अ कंपनी विच इज एक्टिव इनग्रीडियंट्स मैन्युफैक्चरर हु सप्लाइज ए आई टू फॉर्मुलेटर फॉर्मुलेटर वुड बी यू पी एल तानुका और एक्सेट्रा देन ही विल सप्लाई द गुड्स टू डिस्ट्रीब्यूटर एंड देन द डिस्ट्रीब्यूटर सप्लाइज टू द रिटेलर विच इज क्लोज टू द फार्मर सो दिस इज द ब्रेकअप ऑफ डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ केमिकल्स यूज ग्लोबली सो इफ यू सी द परसेंटेज ऑफ हर्बिसाइड्स हैव रिमेन्ड हाई एंड एज फार एज टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन इज कंसर्न हर्बिसाइड्स इज क्लोजली फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ द ओवरऑल एग्रोकेमिकल्स यूज इन परसेंटेज फॉलोड बाई फंगिसाइड्स विच इज क्लोज टू ट्वेंटी सेवन परसेंट एंड हर्बिस इंसेक्टिसाइड्स विच इज क्लोज टू ट्वेंटी फाइव परसेंट वेर एज इन इंडिया इफ यू Insecticides is the one which is having the largest consumption as against the herbicides. So one reason is uh, herbicides uh, where uh, the weeds are developed unwantedly. So people use uh, labor which is very uh, cheap in India rather than using the agrochemicals. However, if we see uh, this percentage over the years, now labor is becoming slightly costlier and hence herbicides have in, uh, humongous growth in terms of uh, percentage growth. Paddy and the cotton are the main. Uh, 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 crops which dominate the domestic market in agrochemicals. So roughly 60% of the ag agrochemicals which is being used is used for these two crops. So consolidation has been a key driver in the global agrochemical market in past few years. So if we see uh, the top six companies globally, they account closely 70% uh, of the market share in the overall agrochem market. Uh, Post the deal of UPL uh, acquiring Arista, it has now become the sixth largest agrochemical player in the world. So, rising product development cost and competition has led to this global consolidation. Also, the regulatory standards to develop new products have become more and more stringent over the years, resulting in higher R&D expenditure for the innovators. The industry is seeing increasing competition from low-cost generic players. India's contribution has doubled from 4% in 2010 to almost 9% in 2019. Similarly, China's contribution has uh, moved up from 18% to 27%, which is the leading uh, consumer. So this is just, this are just the timelines, which shows uh, the overall R&D process has grown over the years, from uh, eight years for developing a molecule to almost 11 years in 2014. So China remains a dominant player in the uh, agrochemical industry. Uh, however, if we see uh, the chart, agrochemical production in China has peaked in 2016, and it, it has declined thereafter. Few of the reasons are uh, the tightening of environmental compliance uh, compliances from 2013 onward. Uh, the Chinese agrochem industry has faced multiple disruptions, environmental inspections, and closures over the last decade. Chinese agrochem production, which rose from 2.8 million metric tons in 2011, it has reached a peak of 3.8 million metric ton in 2016, and since then it has declined to 2.0 million metric ton in 2019. So this has been the timeline of uh, various uh, events which has led to this decline in overall consumption. So in 2013. the air pollution uh, department had came with stringent regulation uh, which led to uh, strict laws and closure of uh, chemical uh, factories in china in 2015 there was an implementation of a uh, new environmental protection law and in 2017 uh, compulsory in inspections were started across the country so this was a act by central government In 2018, uh, state-wise policies have come on banning the new chemical parks. So these are few of the reasons uh, which has led to this uh, overall reduction in the chemical industry in China. So if we see uh, the industry uh, can be subdivided into various groups. Uh, innovators are the big MNC who develop new molecules. It includes names like uh, Dupont, Syngenta. Bayer, Basel, FMC, etc. After this, uh, the second category is the Genrix category, which includes names like Adama, UPL, Sumitomo, etc. 
and then there are uh, smaller player who offer specialized services and focus towards more R and D and the other key developments. So overall, if you see in recent years, capex by uh, ten Indian listed companies is close to forty one billion rupees in last five years, from FY seventeen to FY twenty one. These investments are targeted at catering to domestic as well as both UPL and PIE have spent aggressively. Although UPL is not included in the chart, but they are more into inorganic. PIE has done more organic uh, expansion. Per capita consumption. So India is a leading producer for rice, wheat, and cotton. However, the area treated under agrochemical remains very low. If you compare with uh, global averages, so 35 to 40 percent of the total agriculture area is only treated with agrochemicals today. If you see the share of total agricultural output, India contributes almost 12 percent of agricultural output in the world, but the share of uh, global pesticides is just 1 percent. Top five states: uh, AP, Punjab, Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Gujarat. They consume more than sixty percent of the total agrochemicals in India. So some of the advantages that India has versus global peers, uh, if we compare the labor cost on the left hand side, uh, so India remains the lowest in terms of labor cost if we compare with the developing world and the developed countries. Uh, on the power front, uh, we are cheaper than other countries, but when compared with China, we are twenty percent higher. So India is having a specific regulation with regards to uh, import of chemical pesticides under the Insecticides Act, nineteen sixty-eight. So basically, uh, Section nine three of the Insecticides Act, which says, uh, if India Indian companies have to import either a formulation which is the final good or any technical which is the intermediate, then they need to file this registration under Section nine three. Uh, so these nine three regulations are concerned with the Molecules which are new to the country. So any first-time importer will be filing uh, the uh, guidelines under nine three. Whereas if it's a repeat molecule, which is also known as Me Too registration, that guidelines needs to be followed is under section nine four. So these are the timelines. So uh, section nine three, which is since it's a new molecule, we don't know its side effects. Uh, so documentation, uh, various trials needs to be conducted. And the registration is issued in a period of twelve to thirty-six months. It's more time-consuming, whereas a nine-four, which is a Me Too registration, since the molecule is all already into use, it takes around uh, six months of time. So we look at uh, the revenue trend of few companies in agrochemical sector. So most of the companies have delivered positive growth over a past decade, but companies with large export. Uh, such as UPL and PI, uh, they have continued to deliver double-digit sales growth. Uh, similarly, growth for Bayer, Rallys, and Danuka, uh, it has been affected largely by their only uh, domestic presence, and hence uh, large dependence on the monsoon. In case of PI, uh, the CSM segment, custom synthesis segment, and in case of UPL, uh, their recent acquisitions. Uh, that has provided exposure to multiple regions and uh, different product offerings. Uh, EBITDA margin again is driven by exposure to exports to a large segment. Margins are much higher for PI and UPL because of higher export contribution at seventy percent and eighty percent respectively. Their margin range has remained closer to twenty percent over the last five years. Export-driven companies have higher margin than many global innovators, mainly due to the low cost of production. Rallys has seen a continuous decline in margin, while Danuka margins have been uh, volatile. ROE trend. So, agrochemical companies in general enjoys healthy, or rather more stable return ratios when compared with fertilizer companies. Agrochem companies have limited intervention from the government. And companies have ROE of more than fifteen percent, and going as high as twenty-five percent in few years. 
फिक्स इज एट टर्न ओवर असेट लाइट कंपनीज हैव बेटर फिक्स इज एट टर्न ओवर सो पी सी बेयर एंड धानुका वेर द फिक्स एट टर्न ओवर इज एज हाई एज सेवन एट टाइम्स इज ड्यू टू द आउटसोर्सिंग ऑफ फॉर्मुलेशन मैन्युफैक्चरिंग वेर एज इन केस ऑफ पी आई एंड यू पी एल दे हैव अ लोअर असेट टर्न ओवर ड्यू टू बैकवर्ड इंटीग्रेशन इन इंटरमीडिएट्स एंड टेक्निकल्स धानुका एग्रीटेक रिलाइज हाईली ऑन द इन लाइसेंसिंग ऑफ मॉलिक्यूल्स बाय हैविंग टाई अप विथ ग्लोबल इनोवेटर्स दिस इज अ फ्यू कंपेरिजन बिटवीन बोथ ऑफ दिस सेगमेंट सो इफ यू सी द नेचर ऑफ बिजनेस सो फर्टिलाइजर्स बेसिकली प्रोवाइड्स न्यूट्रिय टू द प्लांट वेर इज द जॉब ऑफ एग्रोकेमिकल इज टू प्रोटेक्ट द प्लांट फ्रॉम पेस्ट इंसेक्ट्स और वीड्स इन टर्म्स ऑफ रेगुलेशन यूरिया इज फुल्ली कंट्रोल्ड बाय द गवर्नमेंट वेर इज नॉन यूरिया इज पार्शियली कंट्रोल्ड इन केस ऑफ एग्रोकेमिकल्स इट इज ऑल्सो रेगुलेटेड अंडर द इंसेक्टिसाइड्स एक्ट बट देर इज नो प्राइजिंग कंट्रोल रॉ मटेरियल सोर्सिंग सो नेचुरल गैस इज लार्जली इम्पोर्टेड इन केस ऑफ नॉन यूरिया पोटैश फॉस्फरिक एसिड एंड अमोनिया ऑल आर इम्पोर्टेड टू द एक्सटेंट ऑफ हंड्रेड परसेंट एटी परसेंट एंड नाइन्टी परसेंट रॉ मटेरियल फॉर एग्रोकेमिकल्स सो द सोर्सिंग इज डन बाई इंडिविजुअल कंपनीज Uh, with some dependency on china which is reducing year by year in case of uh, fertilizer uh, so we don't export uh, it's a 100% domestic market however government has now allowed exports for non urea so we may see some increase in export in the coming years in case of agrochemicals so 50% of the revenue comes from exports demand and supply situation in export market plays an important role for the growth role of monsoon uh in case of fertilizers so it has a limited impact because the sowing has to be done before the monsoon starts whereas in case of agrochemicals it is highly dependent on the monsoon and hence the demand is largely a function of uh monsoon competition so urea is having a low competition as prices are regulated and about 20% is still imported similarly in case of non urea with there are very very few players and hence it's a limited competition segment whereas in agrochemicals the competition is high a share of unorganized sector is high a branding of products educating the farmer and uh, bringing new product offerings plays a very important role here some of the risks and concerns uh, for the agrochemical industry so since uh, only 50% of the land is under irrigation sowing of crops and ultimately the demand for pesticides is highly monsoon dependent so in times of uh, low monsoon uh, agrochemical companies get impacted uh the agriculture input industry has to offer more credit base to distributors dealers and retailers along with higher inventories and some discounts this is because uh, most of the farmers have long term relationship with the channel partners so they offer uh, longer credit days genetically modified seeds uh, have extra features which uh, resist the pest uh, infections and they pose a threat to the pesticide usage agrochemicals exports are close to 50% and most companies are also sourcing uh, around 20 25% of the raw materials outside india hence currency risk remains a uh, very high risk Uh, so, uh, non-genuine illegal pe- pesticides. So these are the products which are not registered, or they are misbranded, or trademark is infringed. The non-genuine industry is close to twenty percent of the market value. So we we'll look at uh, the seed segment. Although there are not very uh, uh, many listed players here, but we'll uh, see what are the major driving factors of this industry. So seed is. Uh, important input for the overall agricultural productivity uh the efficacy of uh, the other agricultural input be it fertilizer irrigation and pesticides so seeds helps in enhancing the production of the overall uh, crop uh, crop growth quality of seed accounts for uh, 20% of the agricultural productivity in terms of uh, global market size so india is fifth largest uh led by us china brazil and canada 
the size of indian seed sector is close to 5 billion dollars uh, growing at 8 to 10% annually seed is a highly uh, seasonal business if you see in terms of revenue most of the revenues close to 70% of the annual revenue uh, comes in q1 uh the buying of seeds happen uh, way before uh, uh, the monsoon starts so in terms of all three uh, segments seed is the one which is uh, less prone to monsoon because most of the buying happens before uh, june month uh, in terms of uh, domination so individual crop wise if you see corn soybean and rice uh, they account for around 60% of the global seeds market so let's try and understand this terminology uh, so these are the two types of seeds available in case of uh, genetically modified seeds the living organisms are used for better efficiency so the dna of the seed is purposefully modified for example if we see bt cotton so cotton plant becomes resistant to different insect uh, bt is uh, refer to bacteria uh, the full form is bacillus thuringiensis uh, although these are uh, this could be harmful uh, if it is used in a higher quantity for the health of human whereas if we see hybrid uh, seeds uh, there is no new gene which is transferred from any animal or insect or living organism uh, so what happens here is so say there are two uh, rice crops uh, one uh, rice uh, can grow with little water and let's say the second one is uh, more resistant with insects so what happens here is uh, cross pollination happens and the farmer gets a bit of both the advantages and they are not harmful for the health of humans in case of gm uh, seeds uh, these are more regulated and restricted so right now the government has only allowed its use for the cotton crop the gm technology was developed by monsanto and they brought this technology in india in 2002 uh, so they started charging royalty for its research and the royalty used to be as high as rupees 1200 per bag which has gradually come down to rupees 20 per bag and recently government has abolished the royalty element however what it has done is it has benefited the overall uh, cro uh, cotton crop yield and it has resulted in uh, three times higher production of cotton so if you see in terms of uh, uh, government regulation so there are no restrictions on usage of hybrid seeds so hybrid rice hybrid maize and hybrid vegetables are uh, profoundly used in this segment just to see how this industry works so a seed company uh, conducts various uh, trials and surveys uh, to understand the farmers needs how uh, they can achieve more uh, yield uh, what kind of seeds are uh, required for increasing the production and what is more effective with different pests and insects so based on this uh, they start developing seeds with genetic or it could be hybrid seeds uh, in case of hybrid it takes around 7 to 10 years of research for developing a new seeds and once uh, a new seed is developed uh, they need to undergo icr uh, government trials for at least 3 years all technical processes are checked and after trials are done uh, they can launch the seeds on a pilot basis a group of farmers needs to test it and based on their satisfactory response they can start distributing and selling commercially in the market so these are different stages of how a seed is commercially launched a uh, breeder is a category where basically experiments and research are carried out on the seeds a foundation is a uh, one which is ready uh, but still not available in the market so the cultivation happens at a very uh, local level or on a pilot basis and finally certified seeds are the one which is available in market for farmers fdi uh, so 100% fdi is now allowed uh, in seed segment under the automatic route for production and development of seeds uh, so this en encourages infusion of foreign investment in the seed sector this helps in uh, developing more r and d activities and development of better varieties of seeds we'll see what are the uh, reasons for uh, high barriers of entry in the seed sector so we've seen a uh, significant r&d investment with long gestation cycle of uh, 7 to 10 years so it has become an entrance for 
newer players to commit uh, huge capital in the segment. Also, uh, one needs to have a wide uh, distribution across India. In case of uh, development of hybrid seed, the overall uh, registration and getting an approval is a very, very uh, complex process. And you need to have a, a high degree of credibility with the farmers as far as uh, the branding is concerned. So, uh, the global seeds market uh, has been dominated by 5 to 6 players which control close to 75% of the market. Uh, so, m and has been a trend since more than two decades, which has resulted into higher market share of bigger MNCs. So, this m and uh, this m and has helped uh, the companies to gain size as well as entry into newer products and geographies. So, if you see, there are a few large deals which has happened recently. Uh, in 2018, uh, Bayer bought Monsanto, uh, with a deal worth of $63 billion, which is the biggest deal in the segment. Similarly, Chem China acquired Syngenta for $43 billion, which is the second largest deal in the segment. So, although there are not many uh, big listed companies uh, in this segment except uh, Kaveri Seed, so we'll just have a look at the journey and uh, few parameters of this growth company. Uh, Mr. G. V. Baskar Rao started a seed production unit in 1986 and they have made continuous development since then. Uh, the company launched its first hybrid maize seed in 1997 and it got eventually listed in the exchange in 2007. 2008 was a milestone year for the company when they launched the first hybrid seed uh, in the cotton named as Jadu. In 2010, uh, the Forbes listed the company best under a billion in Asia and it got this award uh, for three consecutive years in 2010, 11 and 12. And in 2014, company crossed the turnover of 1000 crores. So, Kaveri is a, a leading uh, seed producer with very broad product portfolios that includes hybrids for cotton, corn, rice, bajaran, etc. Uh, I mean, they have a very unique uh, business model in terms of offering different types of seeds. Uh, over the years, if you see the revenue base, they have shifted more towards non-cotton business, which are less regulated, better margins and higher growth. Farmers buy seeds much before monsoon so that they remain prepared for the sowing. So monsoon might not affect them uh, too much in terms of overall sales in the segment because most of the buying happens before the June quarter. So, seeds as an industry is very, very less prone to uh, monsoon. As far as the promoters are concerned, so they belong to uh, Velema community, which is an agricultural community concentrated in Telangana region of Andhra Pradesh. This shows and explains the uh, promoter passion for the seed business. Uh, the company has done five buybacks in past six years. So, in India, uh, if you see, most companies are very uh, crops specific. So, Indian companies have more focused towards uh, cotton crops, whereas MNCs have targeted uh, non-cotton crops. However, if we see the revenue breakup of Kaveri seeds, uh, so they are very, very uh, diversified. Although cotton is uh, close to 35%, at one time it used to be as high as 60% of the revenue. Uh, maize, uh, 25%, hybrid rice, 20%, and rice is 12%. So, very diversified uh, a variety of seeds they have in the product portfolio. These are the cotton price chart for last 10 years. So, uh, it has been uh, very volatile. However, the impact uh, is higher for the companies which have a uh, higher share of cotton seeds as a portion of revenue. Uh, whereas, in case of Kaveri, if you see, we will see the margin which has been less volatile than this. For a general cotton seed manufacturer, if there is any fluctuation in pricing, 5% fluctuate could lead to as high as 8 to 10% impact on their uh, bottom line. So, this is Kaveri Seeds uh, cotton revenue over the years. So, cotton revenues uh, have continuously come down. Uh, revenues have come down almost half in last 7 years. And one reason is the government regulating the cotton price since 2015 onwards. Uh, the cotton prices have now come down to Rs. 750 per bag, which used to be 900 plus at one point. 
another reason for this fall in revenue is uh, india saw a drought in 2015 and 16 where the required rainfall was not received so we've seen uh, genetically modified seeds have that royalty element whereas the hybrid uh, paddy doesn't have any royalty so all the seeds are manufactured by the company in house the revenues were constant till 2018 and have grown rapidly since then so overall trajectory we see from 2007 to 15 company witnessed high cotton sales growth and post that a growth trend has started in hybrid model for the company also if we compare uh, the paddy and the cotton crops the land under cultivation for paddy is almost 4x than the cotton so the growth could remain strong in the coming years for paddy in terms of uh, hybrid seeds uh, utilization so india's share in hybrid seed is still less than 10% whereas uh, china is almost having 90% of seeds consumption as uh, hybrid so there is a long way for india to increase its consumption in hybrid seeds so the revenues have grown from 740 crores in 2016 to 1000 crores in 2023 uh margin percentage again so very very uh, range bound numbers uh, although being a cyclical company so they have been close to 25% margins over the years in terms of roe uh, except one year where drought was severe in 2017 they have been uh, about 20% roe over the years So these are the few sources from where uh, the data is gathered. Ah, uh, that's it. Thanks. Happy to take questions. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, have you done any channel checks on nano dab? Have farmers started using them, and any scalability on that? so not uh, the channel check that i have done so far uh, because we have more focused on the products which have been in use in uh, high numbers uh, but not the specific one which you are referring to hi uh hi you said that you know yeah the hybrid seeds share only 10% in uh, hybrid rye hybrid So, what is the price difference between a regular seed and a hybrid seed? Because maybe that is the reason why farmer is not. So, in case of hybrid, I mean, if you see the development process also, which is a uh, very elongated, I mean, it takes around seven to eight years of overall uh, production process. So, a lot of companies are not keen to uh, you know devote that much of time or uh, cost in that sense. So, developing a new hybrid seed is very challenging uh, for any company. so probably the supply needs to be increased for overall consumption at the farmer level or even the distribution at the farmer level to increase uh, the overall consumption of hybrid so uh, i mean if you compare with china yes uh, 10% versus 90% is a huge huge uh, gap for any country but uh, if we see the last five years trajectory it has increased from 6% to 10% now a regular seed and a cost of pesticide maybe higher definitely definitely seed definitely, definitely. But I think the awareness is also needs to be there, uh, which is increasing, uh, no doubt, uh, year by year. But uh, I mean, that shows huge uh, runway for uh, hybrid seeds as a growth path is concerned. Yeah. Second question was on the pesticide. You said that there are some innovators. So, like in pharma industry, there is some patent period of maybe fifteen, twenty years. So, is there a patent? Like, uh, what is the duration of patent in pesticide before it goes? So, the periods are very long. I mean, it it could range from ten to twenty years. and uh, once this patent uh, goes uh, after the expiry the generic players will start uh, coming and uh, enter the markets so in terms of period it's largely same uh, it doesn't uh, deviate uh, much okay and the last question was on the fertilizer side uh, so like there is not much of innovation is just the seed planted like nitrogen yes 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 right so and there is no really pricing power to extend while it is not government control but there is not a limit you know you can charge a premium because there is no innovation mm. so uh, so is this the distribution muscle which will help for gaining the market share and then and if yes then are the commissions also kept like you know in a in a insurance industry like you know the commissions are kept 
Uh, so is this the same for the fertilizer industry where the you know commissions are kept for distribution or how does how does how do they increase the market share please so in urea yeah so there is no uh, uh, i mean uh, there is nothing much a company can do in terms of innovation uh, is concerned whereas in non urea ipc uh, companies have started developing complex uh, uh, fertilizers also where they have some room and now uh, the exports market has also been started Uh, why urea companies have faced so uh, so much of challenges because of the inefficiency. A lot of these companies are uh, PSU companies uh, when they come to pure specific urea based production. If you see all the private companies, they have a good mixture of uh, uh, specialized urea and also some sort of crop protection materials. So gradually, uh, the efficient companies are moving uh, from a pure urea based clear to more uh, nutrient based uh, fertilizers. Thank you. So you are right that uh, the differentiation happens predominantly on the distribution muscle and the connect with the farmers. How big of a distributor network you have, dealer network you have, how good your distributors and workforce are connected with the farmers. Uh, that is where you will differentiate. Yeah. Chal. Uh, thank you for a very good presentation, and you know you have covered a very vast subject. So I have several questions, but l- let let's see how much. you are you will be able to answer so first of all the urea business which is a very large business so in last 2 3 years i have noticed that the margins of almost all companies have increased the operating margins and the yep. margins um so at global level the prices of post covid because of the logistics disruption and because of ukraine war etc the price of urea shot up uh. and ammonia as well around the world the gas prices which are input to produce urea also went up mm. and then you are talking about there's a cap on the price in india uh, on urea right and there is a sub- huge subsidy 90% subsidy on urea yeah. so i i have not been able to understand how do urea companies make money there is they also receive the subsidy payment very late yes. so there is a huge working capital involved so how do they make money and uh, you know will we be able to like are they interested in expanding their capacity some companies have announced expansion of cap- capacity so can you explain how do they really make money what is what are the levers to make money and you know if you can use maybe a dupont model to understand what is the how do they get their return on equity what is the asset to turnover ratio what is the margin um you know the, even you know the, some gas is available uh, under administrative price mechanism mechanism right to the uh, at subsidized rate so can you please explain what the whole dy- dynamics on this so what we saw the subsidy numbers that keeps on changing so the number what we saw 2500 rupees per 50 kg of back was a subsidy at a particular point in time so the subsidy amount keeps revising after every 6 months so what drives this uh, subsidy amount is uh, two things one is the demand and supply scenario and second as rukun uh, rightly pointed uh, the input cost so what we have seen in last 2 uh, 3 years uh, the prices of all key raw materials the natural gas uh, the ammonia uh, phosphoric acid they've all gone high and now they're coming down and that's the reason why this subsidy amount uh, what the sir said uh, is also coming down so these numbers keep changing every 3 uh, to 6 months uh, that's the reason why uh, the companies will not make loss because the government is also very agile in terms of uh tracking all the input prices what is the demand and supply scenario in the global market and based on which the subsidy amount is uh, derived uh in last 3 years if you see uh, the subsidy disbursal is it is at its peak and that's the reason the cap- working capital days have also come down so if you see uh, the balance sheet health of all these even urea specific companies which are largely dependent on subsidies have also rather improved uh, because the government is releasing subsidies on time Yeah. Is there a fixed margin government wants to give to the companies or return on equity or what? You know, how do they decide the subsidy? I mean, I haven't come across any specific formula which uh, the government has uh, shared in public domain or which is uh, open to the companies to uh, assume. So, I mean, it's it's a very uh, I, mean, I mean there are variable moving parts which uh, based on which the government uh, decides. But there is no transparency as such key. what could be a potential subsidy going forward if let's say the input cost 
uh, has to rise. So that remains uh, anonymous. So I mean, the... and that's the reason why these companies have seen such a volatile margin compared with uh, non-urea companies, which have rather more uh, range-bound margins. So probably that's the reason why only PSU companies are still uh, there in the segment because they have to do uh, service also, social service also. Whereas the private companies have shifted uh, to non-urea, uh, to even the crop protection uh, chemicals. So the second question was in the agrochemicals area, is there any subsidy or something or it's total free market? In agrochemicals, there is no subsidy. Uh, they do come under the regulation of Insecticides Act in terms of the pollution, in terms of toxicity of the raw materials that you use. But as far as the pricing is concerned, there is no uh, uh, total free market. Yes. And the third question is uh, in, in the seed companies. So um, I'm not an expert in this area. So, you know, I've heard that when you use the genetically modified seeds, etc., you cannot reuse the seed. Yes. In the yes. sense that yes. whether crop you cannot save some crop output and use it in the second cycle. That is perfect. But in case of hybrid, my guess is that you can use the seed. So normally the poor farmers in India, what they do is when they grow anything, they keep yes. some part of it for the next cropping cycle. Yes, yes. So that kind of if in hybrid seeds, if they can reuse the seed, then that actually caps the sale of seeds of a company like Kaveri in the next cycle, right? So with all that research and development and investment in brand, etc., once you distribute the seeds in the market, the farmer will keep using that seed. So is that correct? Yeah. So yes, genetically modified seeds can't be reused. Uh, that is uh, well said. Uh, in case of hybrid, what I have understood from channel checks and experts in the field is you can use it for up to two to three cycles because the efficiency of the seeds goes down by the every passing uh, year. So maximum you can use is up to uh, three times. And that's where uh, Kaveri or the uh, innovative player needs to keep inventing new products so that uh, that can sell to the market. So up to three cycles, yes, you can use the hybrid. But beyond that, you need to uh, repurchase. So are there no other companies in the listed space? Or there are very Kaveri? small companies. Nath, Nath Biogenes is there. JK Agri is there. But those are very small companies to be covered. What was a Godrej company also? No? Godrej Agri, right? Yeah, so... Yeah. They are not predominantly in seeds, but they have uh, six uh, sub-segments within the agri space. So again, it becomes like fragmented uh, company to track. Thank you very Thanks. much. Just to add to what uh, Abhishek said, on the urea side, government will give subsidy. So they have a cost of production of urea for each plant. And the difference between the market price and that cost of production for a plant now that cost of production is a is not a very dynamically moving thing. It's been assigned based on whatever legacy formula that they have at that point of time. So that difference is what they will give as subsidy to individual plants. Now in an ideal environment, it would have meant that these would be a fixed ROE kind of a business. But the key issue has been that uh, subsidy has been extremely cyclical and delayed historically. So more than the subsidy it is the fact that you have immense working capital or borrowings on your balance sheet that destroys the roe for these companies so if you got subsidy immediately then probably the roe for these companies looked very different and which is why whenever you had these dbt kind of debates or you know the thought that there will be a dbt coming in uh, that is why there was there's a lot of euphoria because that means then you will not have to use working capital to finance that uh, subsidy, you will immediately get that money. But so far that has not uh, been very effective. So basically, uh, in the data's day uh, slide, what you have showed in fertilizer segment. So in case of Coromandel, which is a private company, the number of days are reducing. In case of PSU companies, they are going up. So largely it is just because of subsidies which have been paid or uh, non-urea can be a, another impact. Hello. 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 In case of, is it audible? Yeah. So in case of uh, Coromandel, they don't have any uh, urea-based production. So uh, they are largely into nutrient-based uh, uh, fertilizers and some bit of 20% around uh, crop protection chemicals. Uh, in mostly, what do you see? Higher uh, uh, data days for the PSU companies. 
and those are the companies which are largely urea based production and hence largely subsidized uh, dependence also uh coromandel has never been uh, in uh, i mean among the last 10 years at least they have never been a urea based uh, company so that's the reason that has always remained lower but for other companies also at least the working capital days have come down because in last 3 years the distribution of subsidy has been very good any questions from the zoom audience i think there's only one like right. conversely no cool thanks then thanks abhishek thank, thank you. you everyone whenever things got rough i always remember what my father used to say running a business does test a man my son there are ups and downs glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated the character of a man and the character of a business are not very different are they yes but when the chips are down we must stand up dust ourselves off and move on volatility it's a funny thing it makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions sure you can question some of your decisions but stay steadfast on your goals dad always said there are no shortcuts and no quick profits there are no free lunches are there there is only one right way at ppfs we think like rahul and his father that volatility is a fact of running a business and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business we use value investing principles to manage your money this means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term ppfs mutual fund there's only one right way mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully